Um, it's interesting how songs can bring things back to you. When my dad was a young preacher in Tennessee, uh, he pastored in Cleveland, Bowman Hills, uh, not far from where I'll be. He had a radio program, and on Sunday morning, I was a little kid, preschool and then first grade there. I would go with him to the radio station, have to s stand outside the room, the lights are on, and he's on the air, and that was the theme song, Jesus Saves. That's good news, and that's the message of today as well. This sermon is entitled, What Is It? Hopefully you'll know before we're done. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this church family. Thank you for this beautiful team. And Lord, um, make the most of the time that I have left with them. I ask your Holy Spirit would be with us today that there are lessons that we, your children, can learn by the children of Exodus. May we learn and may we live differently because we have and in your power, in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had moments you just didn't know what it was you were eating? I've had some of those moments and they have never been good moments. I've done a lot of camping in my time, and whenever people would ask me where I'd been out in the wilderness, um, I would tell them, and then they would say something like, oh, I love camping. I love the smell of the campfire. I don't know what it is, but everything tastes better out there, to which I always would think, of course it does. You're far from civilization. You're exercising more than normal. You're starving. Everything tastes better in those conditions. Uh, so I have... I love camping. I can note two things when they say that to me. Usually, I've met a person who loves camping like I did, past tense. I'm now, in my older age, starting to lean more toward Dana's side than to Rick's, who is the diehard camper still. Um, the other is that they've never camped with my brother-in-law, Gary. When I joined the Versio family, uh, I thought, as we were camping together, wow, my brother-in-law is a cook, followed by the thought, oh great, now Buffy is going to say, why can't you cook like Gary? And that was the thought I had until I ate the first meal that Gary had prepared, and after that I never thought that again. The thing is, and some of you know Gary, um, the thing is I don't think Gary knows that he can't cook, and he won't unless he listens to this sermon, um, which only makes him more dangerous, and he can kill you with kindness with his food. When we get together and he says, I'm going to cook a meal, I try to say, oh, don't bother. Um, and uh, yet he still is very persistent. And then I have to suffer silently, which you know is the worst type of suffering, silently. The first time I had one of his creative meals was in the Tetons. Gary said he was going to make breakfast. I ate it. I don't think you could call that breakfast. And anyway, it was, he said he wanted to try something new. That phrase should have caught my attention and warned me. It should have brought suspicion. Because Gary is a science teacher, a chemistry teacher no less. And when a chemistry teacher says they want to try something new on you, it means that you are going to be a guinea pig in some mad scientist's idea of what a recipe is. And I should have taken that line and fasted during that meal. Basically, you're going to be a lab rat, is what it means. I remember he cooked, and he cooked, and he was having some kind of trouble. And I remember when he was done, I asked him, what is it? To this day, I still ask that question. What is it? I still don't know. He went into some long scientific equation, which only means he didn't know either. But at least it was burnt really bad. I'll say this for my brother-in-law's cooking. It will stick to your ribs even if you don't want it to. Now, you know that I can't make much fun of Gary because you guys know me enough to know that I can't cook either. But at least I know I can't cook, which is the first step to health. Anyway, he loves to cook, which even makes it worse. With my cooking, people move right past the question of what is it to you don't want to know. So have you ever had moments when you're eating something and the biggest question in your mind is, what is it? 
I've had those moments in different parts of the world. And I tell you, they bring a lot of angst. I, I remember being in one place in another country far from here, in, in, a, in a village where it was just, there was a lot of poverty. In fact, the local missionaries and church leaders had told us before we went to the little village not to drink or eat anything. So they had warned us, and I was trying not to even, I would even brush my teeth in that country with bottled water, making sure it was actual bottled water that had never been opened because in that country they will try to sell you bottled water that they have taken from a puddle. So anyway, I'm in this village, and I was the speaker, and I shared with this village with the children a story and that was a country with tigers and things. So I told them a story of grizzly bears and camping. And, and they were riveted. I don't know what the translator was saying. He was probably better than me. And when they were done, this village brought out food for us and drink. They brought it and handed it to each of us. We're in a line. I'm in the center. It works better that way because of my height. But it was because I was the guest speaker. And they handed me this food and they handed me a drink and they... I was told it was drink made from a fruit tree and water from their well. And I was really concerned. I was caught between knowing I should not drink or eat this, but also that this was a, a, a people that in their culture, it means so much that you eat this and I'm going to die was my thought. So there I was um, trying to think about what I was going to do. And I thought, if they'll just look away. But <clears throat> the, they were riveted on me. Because one, I, I was white. Two, I was the tallest person they probably had ever seen. So I was an albino tree, and they'd never seen this before. And they're riveted on me. And all those other missionaries, and even my wife and my associate pastor that were on that trip, they quietly poured the drink out behind them and put the food in their pockets or purses. I, on the other hand, had no reprieve. They were all watching me. Greater love hath no pastor than this. Then he laid down his life for his associates and the missionaries that are local. I can tell you from personal experience that moments like that add new meaning to blessings that you pray your blessing with a whole other dimension. You are praying for the Lord to bless this food and you are saying silently, and please don't let it kill me. It was after that I thought, I really shouldn't have prayed, don't let it kill me. I should have said, don't let it kill me and please don't let it make me violently sick because it didn't kill me, but it made me violently sick. I remember another meal with another people group from another place in this world. We were sitting on the ground and people were bringing, these poor people were bringing their food and setting it before us. And, and they went back for more. And, and, and I knew in their culture that our eating this with them meant so much to them. And I loved these people. And I, they were going to kill me is what I felt as I looked at the food. And, and I remember the intern, I, I wasn't all that old, but I was the more seasoned veteran. He, he looked at me when they left and he said, <laughs> With a very serious look, he whispered, Ron, what is it? <laughs> Being the seasoned veteran I was, I whispered, I don't know. <laughs> Pray, eat, and smile. <laughs> this, is, this was my threefold plan. <laughs> Pray, eat, and smile, and maybe pray some more. In fact, we were practicing what the Bible says from that moment on of praying without ceasing, and no one had to twist our arms. So to this day, I still do not know what I ate that day. I'm just glad I lived. I'm not sure what it was. Have you ever been at a meal, where the, and hopefully not at potluck today, where the question was, <clears throat> and I didn't bring anything, so it shouldn't happen here. What is it? I, I came across just such a day this week found in the book of Exodus, chapter 16. So we're going to spend time today in Exodus 16, in John chapter 6, and in Hebrews chapter 9. But first this, Exodus 16, verse 15, and it's talking about the manna, and the people of Israel have a question. And the question is, what 
is it? And Moses, with all his not so happy campers out in the wilderness, at least they didn't have Gary leading them, the food is there and they are asking the question, what is it? Today, we seek to find the answer to their question, but Lord willing, the answer to ours as well. The answer for us, the children of God, now, still wandering around in the wilderness. Exodus 16, verse 15, you hear them asking, what is it? As a kid, I never knew that manna simply meant, what is it, in Hebrew. In fact, I didn't know it for years. I mean, I thought it was some special name. Maybe some of you have too. I thought it was like some heavenly name. I didn't know they were just asking what it was. And they asked it so much that it caught on. Manna, what is it? And that's what manna means. They went out to gather it, probably for the first time, and someone said to somebody else, what is it? And voila, you had the name of Israel's menu for the next 40 years. Simple. Maybe it's just me with my twisted mind, which you've put up now with for almost four years. But when I think about that, I, I, I actually try to picture the scene, and I can't help but thinking about the confusion that the name of this food must have caused early on when mealtime came for the children. Mom, what are we having to eat for breakfast? <laughs> what is it? To which mom answers, what is it? And that had to be confusing. So the kid asks again, what is it? And the mom answers, what is it? No, mom, I mean, what are we having? What? She answers. No, what is it? Asks the kid. And the mom says, precisely. Precisely what? Exactly. No, what is it we're eating? What is it we're eating? Says mom. What is it? No, that's what I just asked you. What is it? And I can see this going on with the confusion until they finally understand. What is it? What exactly? That's what it is. Manna. Being of the age I am, I can't help but think that Abbott and Costello would have had a lot of fun out in the wilderness with manna. Better than who's on first. What are we having for dinner? What is it? It was the first thing that was asked, and the question stuck. And so did the name, manna, which means, yeah. I, I thought the name was heavenly. It wasn't. But the gift was, and the gift is. I, I thought it was a heavenly meal, and it was, and it still is, a heavenly gift. And the question's still there after all of these years. So I think some questions are worth answering. What it was for them and what it is for us. You see, there are some questions that need answering. So let's take our journey back to Exodus chapter 16. And we'll start out with verses 1 through 4. We'll work our way through more of this as we go on. But to begin with, in Exodus 16, they've been led, remember, 10 plagues, set free, battle against Egyptian gods and true God. Then at the Red Sea, they're asking, did you take us out here to kill us? God just wants us dead. And then he parts the Red Sea. And now they're out there and they're getting hungry and this is what happens. And they journeyed from Elam. And all of the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Now, even as a kid, I always thought, what a perfect name for this group out in that wilderness. And I know my Hebrew and other teachers could say it better, but I love how it says here in this old New King James, capital S-I-N, the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the children of Israel praised the Lord again. Don't you wish? 
complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now, I know you can't work your way to heaven, and I know that God is no respecter of persons, but a respecter of everybody, but I got to think Moses sure, he needs an extra cushion in heaven for what he went through. The children of Israel said to them, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. And they say this multiple times. And I say, be very careful what you ask for. Oh, that we had died in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Hmm. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. They'll ask that one. It's so good back in Egypt. Pots of meat and bread to the full. I mean, wasn't it so awesome back in Egypt? Being slaves back in Egypt. Building pyramids back in Egypt. Dying under a taskmaster's whip back in Egypt. I mean, no wonder they're so wistful for Egypt. I mean, they had it so good back there. They were right about one thing, though. Back there, they were sitting by pots all right, but they were mud pots and a taskmaster's whip. At this point, Moses thinks, I, I, I think maybe Moses should have said this. You figured it out. You've got me. That's been my plan all this time. I, I'm 80 years old. I wanted to leave Midian as a shepherd so I could come back to Egypt to, and I would have to face Pharaoh with God and I'd have to listen to all your belly aching as he delivers you. I mean, you got me. My whole plan was to get you out here so God could kill you. For 80 years, it's been my lifelong dream and ambition. I've thought about it, planned it, and now my dream is coming true. Have you ever read this? It's in the Weiner's translation, the clear Weiner's translation. When I read these verses here, they speak to me too. Because I've complained plenty. But chapter 16 um, is actually a chapter of many gifts of God. And a test. Will we truly trust and rely on God? God our provider. God who will not let us down. In this chapter, God is trying to teach his people about faith. Because in a sinful world, faith is about the most important thing you can come across. And it's important that God's children trust God, even when it doesn't look good. In their journey through the wilderness, they're going to have to trust God. I don't know about you, but I consider where we live, this is a very pretty part of the wilderness, but we in this sinful world are in a wilderness too. And we need to learn to depend fully on God and to trust him completely because he is the God that provides. And he loves us more than we've ever loved anybody. Amen. He is provider God. And that journey through the wilderness, they're going to have to learn to trust him, not just once in a while, this is what's speaking to me, in this, but every day. And in this chapter, he's going to teach them how to count to seven. And this happens before Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments. One, two, three, four, five, six, double portion. You remember what would happen if they take the double portion any other day but the sixth day. Worms. I think I've eaten those some before too, and it really gets to me. And the seventh day was a day of rest with their God. 400 years of slavery 
And God is giving them sacred rest. A day that is to be holy, W, holy other. A day different than the rest, a rest day, a holy, H, holy day. And chapter 16 is filled with all these beautiful gifts. The manna is a gift. The Sabbath is a gift to slaves. You see, God's children need the Sabbath. And in this hurried and harried wilderness we live in, in the craziness of our calendars that threaten to snuff the life out of us, we need these sacred gifts too. The bread from heaven and a special Sabbath weekly with him. Sacred and holy, renewed, revived. In this chapter, God is teaching Israel that to walk through the wilderness is going to take faith, and not just any kind of faith, not faith in themselves or faith in their abilities, not faith in what they packed, not faith in how hard they can work or their ingenuity or what they might be able to accomplish. This is all about putting their faith in God. So it's not enough to have faith. You have to have a particular kind of faith, a faith that looks to God and nowhere else. See, God has always been trying to teach his children in the wilderness, whether back there or here, to trust him, to depend on him daily. And if you will, the peace that comes to you, and you will be fed. And you will have life. For 40 years, they walked around the wilderness in circles asking, what is it? They didn't know, but they knew it was something so important that they needed to put some. And this is where you go to Hebrews 9. And they couldn't even put it in there. It would have taken a high priest. So special. Such a type that they needed to put a bowl, a golden bowl of manna in the most holy place right before the Ark of the Covenant. And they may not understand the reason why, but God sure did. And I want you to think about how this fits. They, the story starts in a beautiful garden but sin comes into the world and it becomes a wilderness. God gave a sacred gift in the garden, taught them to count to seven and, and a rest. And God himself, it says, rested with them. I want you to think about what a golden bowl of manna would mean sitting there by the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies the most sacred place, in some respects, like a throne room as well as a courtroom, a saving room, a throne room of God. The manna is there. Those Israelites may not have understood why, but God sure did. And we find out why in John chapter 6. I want you to go there. First of all, there's the feeding of the 5,000 in this chapter, and it's a lot more than 5,000. They foolishly only counted the men when the women and children should have been counted first. They're too far away from town. Israel is in the wilderness. And Israel is hungry. So we come to chapter 6. And we get the answer to what manna is. The answer to what is it. We go there to John 6, but not just to one section of Scripture, but to hear what Jesus says. The Word himself answers the question. In John chapter 6, Jesus Christ, the Word, is going to exegete the Word. And when you have questions about the Word, there is no better teacher, preacher, than Jesus to tell you what it means. And he is going to exegete the Old Testament for them here. The sad thing is that after he does, they won't like the answer. No, worse than that, they are not going to love the answer. 
So the context is that earlier in the chapter, Jesus has fed more than 5,000 people, a whole lot more. He's fed Israel in the wilderness. God has provided a miraculous meal in the wilderness. They catch up to him the next day, and they want more bread. They just want a magician's circus. To which Jesus says, and I'm going to, I'm going to read through different verses here, so follow me. I'll tell you where I'm going. I'm going to start in verse 30. I want you to hear what they say to him before you hear what he says. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we see it and believe you? Okay, um, breaks. What signs has he already given them? You know, sometimes we want more and more signs, and sometimes God says, you've seen enough, trust me. They said to him, what sign will you perform? They sound like they're King Herod, don't they? What work will you do? Now they're going to try to teach the word, the Bible. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now hear the word. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the what? Oh, yeah. Drop down to verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, so you know the answer. It's no mystery here. He's saying, I am the bread from heaven. If you read through the story of the wilderness, you will find that Jesus is everywhere with them. I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will. That's what he's going to pray in Gethsemane, isn't he? So he can give us life, life to this world. But the will of him who sent me. Drop down, verse 48 through 51. How plain can he make it? I am, Greek words, egoimi. Find it in John. It's always before something. I am life. I am the bread. I am living one. He is saying what was said to Moses at the burning bush. Who do I say sends me? You tell Pharaoh, I am that I am. Not I was, not I will be. Always God. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are what? This is the bread which comes down from heaven. This is what all those meals were about. I am what this is about. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that the one may eat of it and not die. This is about salvation. I am, again, the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live how long? Aren't you glad to have that promise? Forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh. Sounds like communion, doesn't it? Which I shall give for the life of the world. Well, spiritual Israel, well, children of God, you know we live in a wilderness. But you also know what manna is now. It's not what is it. It's Jesus Christ. He is what you need. Daily. Not just now and then on special holidays or the weekends. Daily. 
to take him in daily. He is what you hunger for. And he is the only thing that can fill your emptiness. He is the one that will give you life if you will just take it. He is the one that will give you the strength you need to walk in this wilderness. And not only walk in this wilderness, he is the only one that can give you the strength to cross over Jordan. Only he can take you there. Yeshua, Joshua. Oh, yeah. Jesus says, I am the bread of heaven. And here, type meets antitype, my theologian friends. So in a way... It was symbolically like the children of Israel had been having a symbolic daily communion for 40 years in the wilderness, or they could have been. But how many times, we can't just look at them and shake our heads, how many times have we neglected the communion we could have with Jesus Christ daily in this wilderness? They didn't get it. And while they got something from it, they squandered so much more. But don't you? Do not squander this daily gift. Jesus says, I am the bread of heaven. And he's not just the bread of heaven for somebody else. He is the bread of heaven for you. I am the bread of life. For 40 years of wilderness wandering, the children of Israel ask, what is it? Here in John chapter 6, Jesus gives the answer. He was the answer back then. He was the answer in John chapter 6. And he is still the answer today. And he is what you and I need desperately. Our Father God, your word from Genesis to Revelation fits better than any of us here know. Thank you for the being the God that doesn't just watch from afar, but that you are with us. Lord, we are tired of wandering in this wilderness and we long for home. Fill us with yourself. Help us to feed on the bread of life. Help us to live in your living water. Help us to surrender and truly trust you, Jesus. I pray this for our sake and for your honor. Amen. Amen.